Okay, take two. <laughs> Here's our second shot at doing tonight's webinar. The, tonight's going to be a really cool and interesting class because we're going to be talking about endangered species. And if you're like me, everyone loves the thought, well, you don't like the thought of endangered species, but the fact that we could potentially help them out and save them is really, really appealing. And so I will tell you, when I first started my career, I went to school to become a wildlife biologist. And when I first started my career, I didn't know much about endangered species, but after about 30 years or so, I picked up a few things. So what I want you to do is kind of sit back, relax. There's going to be a lot of legalese, some, some terminology that we use in the endangered species world. But I hopeful, hopefully at the end of this, you'll have a much better understanding of what endangered species are. So to get things started, I know who all you are. And guess what? You all know who I am. Daryl Radijak, been a wildlife biologist for over 25 years. I've done all sorts of things in the wildlife world. And one of those things is uh, dealing with a lot of different species. I specialize in large carnivores, but I've also worked with quite a few species. So to kick off tonight's class about endangered species, what I'm going to do is I'm going to relay a story. I, I put this slide up here because my very, very first encounter in my young career, that's me. Oh, the shoot, that's 25 years ago uh, when I was working at the Appalachian Bear Center. My first encounter with dealing or hearing about endangered species was when I first took that job at the Appalachian Bear Center. And believe it or not, I didn't even start working there yet. Um, I had walked into the position in June of 1997, and I received this letter from the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, and it was not a nice letter. It was from one of the people in leadership at the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, and they wrote a scathing letter kind of reprimanding the Bear Center because one of its board members or one, someone affiliated with the Bear Center wrote this article, and I don't know if it was published in a local newspaper, but they wrote this article about how the Bear Center was working to save endangered black bears in the Smokies. And the article more or less said, that is completely false. Do not ever promote this propaganda again because black bears are not an endangered species. And at first I'm like, wow, somebody's triggered. <laughs> um, but after working for, like I said, almost 30 years dealing with lots of different species, this idea or this concept of endangered species is really, really tight. And there's there's no there's no wiggle room when it comes to talking about endangered species. And hopefully after you watch this presentation, you'll understand why. So that is my first time ever hearing with hearing about or dealing with endangered species and just so you know black bears are not endangered all right so why in the world are we going to be talking about endangered species we love talking about species that are thriving and doing well why do we have to talk about the not so fun stuff well believe it or not and you all know this because i preach about it all the time early europeans were horrible at moderating their take. They exploited animals. They they looked at animals as a res resource for them to use at will whenever they wanted to. And many of you probably recognize that photograph, but it's a photograph that, that is a mountain of bison skulls. And you all know the, the Great Plains and much of North America were covered in bison and the U.S. government and lots of folks utilized bison and they exploited them. In fact, they waged war on the bison and they they wiped, they nearly wiped them out from a herd of probably close to 60 million down to less than a couple hundred. And so that's one example of us exploiting animals. Um, does anyone know what this is? Feel free to type it in since apparently no one can turn on their microphone. <laughs> I don't know what kind of animal that is. No one's going to it's a pigeon. Yeah, it's a passenger pigeon. Very good, Patricia. So a passenger pigeon, they, they numbered in the millions upon millions throughout North America. They were also considered a delicacy. So throughout the 1800s and early 1900s, we shot them at will. And they were meant to supply the, 
the restaurants in the east. And so before we knew it, we took a population of millions upon millions of birds. And unfortunately, the last passenger pigeon died on our watch in the, the mid 1900s. And so we were using animals at will for whatever we needed. And so we did not have a really good reputation of being concerned about species or how many animals were left within a species. But besides, besides that, let, um, I'm reading the comment here. Oh, the, the, the polar bear is another great example of a species that's on the brink, good, good comment. Um, so going back to the presentation, we we did not do a good job looking over individual species, but guess what else we were really pissed poor at? We did a horrible job at looking out for habitat. Here it is, the, the new world, this new land, and I can imagine hundreds and hundreds of years ago, it looked like unexhaustible resources with the timber and, and the wildlife that was there. And so, like I said, the early Europeans they they used things at their will. And so they began to cut trees and kind of rework the habitat to their liking. And so when you go in there and you completely denude the habitat, there's not much there that can survive or that, that thrive in a habitat like that. And so besides exploiting the animal itself, we really decimated a lot of habitats out there. And so you can understand why late 1800s, some people, some very brilliant people, namely this gentleman, if you don't know, that is Eldo Leopold, they started seeing things that were grossly wrong with how we we're managing our wildlife in North America. And so he is considered, Eldo Leopold is considered the father of wildlife management, but he saw that wildlife were not this inexhaustible resource. We not only had to protect the species, but we had to protect the habitats that they thrived in. And so because of him and folks like Teddy Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, some of the early pioneers of, of our natural resources, they started the, the wheels or the, the they started the ball rolling for Congress to enact legislation to begin to protect our wildlife resources. And so it was because of them that we now have state wildlife agencies. So agencies that are solely dedicated to protecting wildlife in North America. Um, we also have advancements in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and lots of pieces of legislation to provide funding for wildlife in North America. And the big question, though, was they started that ball rolling, but was that enough? Was the, ons the onset of state wildlife agencies enough to save the animals? And the problem is, you think about it, that that industrialization of North America was well underway throughout the early 1900s, mid 1900s, late 1900s. We were developing North America faster than you could imagine. And so this industrialization obviously led to urbanization. You have big cities growing up all over North America. The United States was growing. Obviously people living in, in cities need resources, they need food, they need timber, they need all that stuff to supply it. And the problem was with this kind of uncontrolled growth that was taking place, unfortunately, species throughout the mid 1900s continued to struggle. It, it, was, it was very difficult on wildlife with this rapid industrialization and rapid urbanization of North America. And so can anyone guess what happened in 1973 that really helped protect the animals? There was a piece of legislation that was passed. Can anyone guess what that was? It's about tonight's topic. <laughs> Very good, Trish. ESA, which stands for the Endangered Species Act. Now, I will tell you that was not the initial. There was actually... There is an Endangered Species Conservation Act that was passed, I think, in the late 1960s. But all that did was create a list of animals that said, hey, guess what? These animals are imperiled. But that's what it was. It was a list. And so it didn't afford protections or anything. And so it wasn't until 1973 with this new Endangered Species Act that we started instituting protections for a lot of these 
species that were imperiled. So what I want to do is spend about 10, 15 minutes talking about the Endangered Species Act, because this is the crux of whenever we're talking about um, endangered species. And just so you know, what the Endangered Species Act is, it's the primary law for the United States, and it's meant to protect those imperiled species, the, the species that we're worried about. Um, and the main goal here is to ensure that those critically imperiled species do not go extinct. That is the, the whole reasoning behind that Endangered Species Act. But what's really interesting, if you're ever really, really bored or you want, <laughs> you're trying to find a good way to fall asleep, read the Endangered Species Act. Um, but there's there's some interesting verbiage in there, and I don't have the whole quote, but it was more or less enacted because it, it was a consequence of economic growth and industrialization or development in light of no conservation protections. And so it, it admits we were growing too fast and everything was human focused and there was no focus on our on our wildlife resources. And so thankfully, President Nixon signed the Endangered Species Act in 1973. And this is, the, this is what gave us teeth to begin protecting those animals that are imperiled and were close to extinction. And so what I want, the, there's lots of laws out there, lots of wildlife laws, whether or not it's state or federal or anything. And so it's just a simple law. And so how powerful can ESA be? I'm gonna call it ESA quite a bit. When I do, it's Endangered Species Act. But how powerful can the Endangered Species Act be? Um, I would quiz you on this dam, but it's not a very well-known dam. But let's talk about a dam for a second. Uh, there is a government agency. It's called TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority. Everyone thinks that some people think it's a state agency, but it's a federal agency. And what the TVA does is they dam rivers, and it's for the benefit of the American people because damming those rivers provides electricity and provides um, control of the waters for flooding and irrigation. And so TVA for 100, well, I don't know when TVA was formed, but it's probably getting upwards of 80, maybe, maybe it is 100 years old. Um, but they, they're responsible for damming a lot of the rivers in the east. Now, in the west, there's a whole different organization um, that does a lot of that stuff. But this particular photograph is a dam. It's called the Teleco Dam. And they began working on that project uh, late 1960s. And they felt damming the Teleco River was going to provide thousands of jobs for the local economy. And it'll also provide electricity. It's also going to provide that, like I said, flooding and irrigation control. This was going to be an amazingly wonderful project for the people of Tennessee living in that area with the construction of that dam. And so they began working on it in the early 1970s. And as they were working on this dam, there is a researcher out of the University of Tennessee, David Eitner, that found this small species of fish, it was called a darter, that was located in the river that was getting dammed. And this, this darter just so happened to be on the endangered species list. And so it was brought to the attention of the powers that be to say, hey, this dam is going to impact this endangered species. And you have to understand this fish it's only a couple inches long. No one even knows what it is. No one has rarely ever seen it. It is only kind of known to the researchers in the area. And they said, this dam is going to imperil this endangered species. So we got to stop the dam. And it put a screeching halt to the construction of that dam. And here it was, it was kind of like a, a blindsided punch. It's like, where'd this fish come from? No one cares about this fish. But yet you have this Endangered Species Act, which says... You can't do stuff that's going to endanger certain species. And so just overnight, it became tied up in litigation and courts. Is the dam going to go through? Is it not going to go through? Needless to say, it was tied up for about six years. As you can see from the picture, the dam finally was constructed. And one of the reasons why it was constructed is because that whole dam project was started prior to the passage of the Endangered Species Act. 
So they they suddenly realize, you know what? This Endangered Species Act, although there's an exception here because the project was started earlier, is a pretty powerful tool for um, making sure that endangered species don't go, don't go extinct. And so needless to say, this ESA, this Endangered Species Act, is pretty darn powerful piece of legislation. So we're going to talk, th this is where we get into a lot of verbiage, but we're going to talk about how the Endangered Species Act works. Now, there's two main classifications of animals, and you've probably heard me refer to it about a dozen or two times. You've probably heard me talk about t and &E species. t and &E species stands for threatened species or endangered species. Now, what do you think is the worst thing that could happen to a species? We're going to talk about endangered species first. And so the worst thing that can happen to endangered species is that they could go extinct. So an endangered species is in immediate and imminent threat of becoming extinct. They no longer exist in the world. And so endangered species, you can just think of those species that just, they're on the brink of extinction. Now, a threatened species is kind of just one step lower. It's a species that's an immediate threat of becoming endangered. So it's it's just a matter of degrees. So by far, endangered species are more imperiled. They're about to become extinct, where a threatened species may be about to become endangered. And so, like, like I said, just two steps or two degrees of being threatened. But by and large, an endangered species is the one that we're most concerned with because they could go ex extinct. Now, I will say I won't go into too much detail here, but the Endangered Species Act has lots of terminology in that. And you might hear pe people talk about some species that are candidate species or proposed species. There are species out there that nobody's talking about or nobody's really doing anything. And, and someone might come along, whether or not it's a private conservation group or, or a person or a researcher that says, hey, you know what? This species, this, this butterfly is not doing so good. It's rapidly declining. We need to get it listed on the endangered species list. And that then the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, just so you know, is the agency that's that's over the Endangered Species Act. The Fish and Wildlife Service will then consider that they'll begin researching that particular species, and it will be a candidate species. Does this candidate species deserve to be on the list? And I will tell you, folks, there's a lot of times we, we get uh, these proposals to review these candidate species, and it's going to take years and years to gather information. We might have to conduct more research. It takes a very long time to go through this review process to see if that candidate's species deserves listing. And if it does, then it moves to the next category, which is a proposed species. It's, it's proposed to be listed. And again, there's a process there. So candidate and proposed species are species that are under consideration to be listed on the endangered species list. To be listed as either a threatened or endangered species. So um, one of the things that a lot of... Okay, before I go too much further, Trish asked a question about the cost for one species to be saved. Do you see a bottom line? Would you guess thousands, maybe millions, probably a lot of variables? Well, your your last sentence says it all, Trish. There, there is no dollar amount you could put on it because there are some species that will thrive if we leave them alone. Say, say most of their habitat is on federal land and all we have to do is protect that federal land, make sure it does not get degraded then we, we don't have to do much. So the, the cost is next to nothing. We're, we're already protecting it. But then there are other species that might require propagation of animals and trying to establish new populations or more research that can cost millions and millions of dollars. And so, like I said, you hit the nail on the head. There's so many variables. It could be relatively cheap to help these species out, or it can be ungodly expensive 
to try to help these species out. So I wish there was a solid answer, but it's it's truly highly variable. But I, I imagine some of you out there are thinking, well, are we just talking species that are found in the US? Or are we talking global? Well, believe it or not, it's 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 both of those. The Endangered Species Act, what, what we do is we list all the species in the United States that are either threatened or endangered, but we also have a foreign list or a global list of those endangered species. Now, obviously, the United States does not employ people working in every single country across the world. And so we rely on other countries to provide information. And fortunately, there's this organization called IUCN stands for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And pretty much all the countries belong to it and lots of wildlife research. And so this IUCN keeps kind of a global list of all the endangered species found throughout the entire world. And so not every country participates, but most developed modern countries participate in that. And so we, we not only have a list of endangered species in the United States, but we also have this foreign list or this global list of endangered species. So what happens, I, I've talked about this list, this t and &E list. What happens when an animal becomes listed as either threatened or endangered? Well, immediately they're afforded federal protections. The, we are now saying this species, we're concerned about it, and there's penalties for doing bad things to it. Now, obviously with the threatened and endangered, there's most of the protections are in the endangered species, but there's a lot of protections on threatened species because we don't want them moving to that endangered list. So what happens when an animal makes the list as either threatened or endangered? In most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the overseer of this Endangered Species Act, they develop what is called a recovery plan. I put a little picture up, up there of the grizzly bear recovery plan, but every species or most species will have a recovery plan. And what that recovery plan outlines, it outlines the things that animal needs in order to survive and to recover. And so those key elements, there, there might be habitat elements that are required for the species. Like if it's a type of woodpecker, then they depend on snags, these dead and dying trees uh, to, to build their nests. And so they'll identify all those key elements, what type of habitat those animals need. And they're gonna try to protect those key elements to make sure it's always there for that species in order to thrive or recover. A lot of times they'll try to restore those key elements which may be missing. Another thing that those recovery plans might do is they might identify critical habitat. What critical habitat, it, it's a federal designation that says this land area here, it could be a part of a state, it could be a part of a national park, just they'll identify a part of the country that says this area here is critical habitat for this endangered species. And that comes at a big I don't want to say a big cost, but there's a big tag that goes onto critical habitat because it doesn't matter if it's federal property or private property, if it's within that area that's identified as critical habitat, there's restrictions on what you can do because there's a species that is reliant on that land in order to survive an endangered species. And so there's limitations on what can be then what can then be done on that land. And so oftentimes that's why there's a lot of butt puckering by the public if an endangered species is found on your land because there might be limitations on what you can do. For the most part, it doesn't affect private property too much. A lot of restrictions definitely fall on federal property though. So what happens, what happens when you have an endangered species and you want to do something with that land? <clears throat> So what usually takes place, and, and this is all outlined in section seven of the Endangered Species Act. And so this is a lot of what wildlife biologists who work for the federal government, whether or not it's the US Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management, this is a lot of what they do. And so remember, federal land is not set aside for wildlife. 
It's set aside for the benefit of the American public. And so it has multiple uses. Yes, wildlife is one use, but there's also timber, there's grazing, there's oil and gas production, there's cultural resources, there's lots of uses, recreation. And so there's lots of uses for that land. And a lot of times we have different projects that will take place. For example, there might be a timber cut, there might be a gas and oil lease proposal, there might be a new hiking trail that is proposed on this federal land. And so whenever there's an action, if there's a project that's going to take place and an action is going to happen on federal lands, what we have to do is we have to assess what are the impacts of that action on that land. And so oftentimes there, there are some projects where you know, there's already an existing, uh, say there was an existing right of way and they just want to go in there and clean up the vegetation under underneath the power lines. And so there might be a finding of no significant impact. It's what's, it's the coolest name, it's called a Fonzie. But it's, it's literally, you know what, we're going to do this action and it's not going to have any negative impacts to anything out there. And so sometimes they'll issue that finding of no significant impact. Oftentimes though, the whatever action is proposed, you realize, you know what, we're going to have an impact to this. You, you look there to see if there's any threatened or endangered species there. And if the action you're proposing is likely to affect that species, then you have to do this biological assessment. Say, all right, if we do this timber cut, if we put in this gas and oil lease, if we put in this hiking trail, there's going to be an impact to those threatened and endangered species that live there. And so what you have to do then is you have to request this formal consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And you literally sit down at the table and say, all right, here's the action we want to undertake. Is there any way we can do this without having major impact to this to this particular species? And we'll work with them. That's kind of what we do. We work with both agencies to say, all right, instead of doing the project this way, let's try to do it this way so we have less of an impact. And so we'll work on different things. And they understand that there's there are some projects that are for the benefit of the American public that's going to have a negative impact to certain T and E species. And what they could do is they can recommend that they'll release a biological opinion and they'll recommend certain ways of doing it, or they will even recommend, or they'll, they'll, they'll write a take statement to say, yes, this project can go through. And we understand that you're going to impact the critical habitat. You're going to impact the species this amount. And that's okay. We, we approve that. We don't like it, but we approve it. And so anyway, that's what a lot of work when you, when it comes to the field of wildlife biology, if you're a biologist for either the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, the, the Bureau of Land Management, oftentimes that's what a big part of your job is, is what are the impacts that the humans are having on endangered species. And so a lot of them work with endangered species. I'm one of the lucky ones that work with game species. So anyway, here's something really interesting. Now, I mentioned before about that dam project, which is a huge economic driver in an area, big project for economic growth. So it's a big benefit for the American public. Well, what happens if a project is proposed and it's going to have major, major consequences for a certain endangered species. They they wrote into the plan, I think it was a couple of years afterward, actually. Um, they have this Endangered Species Act committee that they can call, and I forget who sits on it, but they will literally make the determination whether or not that project can go through, and they do have the ability for the benefit of the American public to make a call that could be to the detriment of an entire species that could potentially wipe out an entire species. And there's a there's a nickname they give to the ESA committee. Would anyone happen to know what that is? It's a very fitting nickname. You may not know it. But that ESA committee, if they're going to determine the fate of a particular species, whether or not it's 
it lives or becomes extinct. It's called the God Squad. Now, I don't think there's ever been a decision where they they made a decision wiped out an entire species but they do have that power to and so that's the nickname given to it i think it's kind of fitting because they decide the fate of an entire species okay i talked quite a bit about lists the endangered species act creates this list of threatened and endangered species let's look at that list and i, I just have summary tables here but I, I will show you the website where all this comes from. It's absolutely fantabulous and you could get lost exploring so many different things there. But if you look, um, this is divided up. Remember I said there's a United States list. There's a foreign list and you have all these different groups, amphibians, arachnids, birds, mammals, reptiles. Just so you know, I don't even, I have no idea what hydroids are. I read about them and I still don't understand what they are. <laughs> anyway, if you look, in the United States, there's 1,269 species on the endangered species list, 403 that are listed as threatened. So we got 1,672 1, species on the t and &E list. The thing that's interesting, if you look at the top here, it says, here's the list as of Thursday, November 22nd. <laughs> um, the reason being, this changes all the time. Believe it or not, today when I was working, I received an email that they just listed the lesser prairie chicken. And so this thing is updated constantly. So you can't you can't put it on a test how many species are in the endangered species list because it's dynamic. Species can get added, species can come off. Um, but anyway, 1,600 animals on the t &E list for the United States alone. That's a lot. Uh, you can see that there's some categories. Fishes have a whole bunch of animals listed there. Um, it's the leading category. But besides being listed in the United States, you see this foreign category. And so altogether, there is a whole bunch of animals globally that are either threatened or endangered that we're really concerned about. So, all right, what I want to do now is, uh, in fact, I'll spend the rest of the time talking about some of the more popular t &E species that are found in the United States. Uh, just kind of trivial stories. Gosh darn it, I wish you could turn on your microphones. I wish I knew what was going on there. Anyway, I found this map yesterday. I thought it was really interesting because it shows how many listed species are in each county across the United States, across, yeah, I was going to say North America, but across the United States. And so obviously these white or light blue only have um, zero or or one species. Then as it gets darker blue, you got two to four species. The yellow, you're starting to get five to nine different species in that particular county that are listed on the t and &E list. And the red is over 10 species. And so obviously those red counties have a tremendous amount of diversity. And you look at this and it, it surprised me initially because when I think of diversity, I, I think of like back in the East, when you're talking about how many different species of trees there are, it's just crazy compared to the West. It seems like the West is so much less diverse. However, you have to think about the ecosystems here. If you were to live in any one of these states, if you lived in, say, Virginia or, or New York or Tennessee, it's it's a fairly uniform ecosystem. That, that temperate climate, forested ecosystem, yes, you have some of these smaller pockets here and there. Um, but when you go in the Southwest, California, Arizona, even, even into New Mexico, you probably heard me talking all the time, especially if you see me on Facebook, is I could start my day in alpine tundra, high up on some mountain peak around me, or I could just drive down the mountain and within a couple hours, I could be in some desert canyon. And because of a lot of those elevational changes, there's there's a lot of different ecosystems, like I said, from alpine tundra to desert. And because of those 
multiple ecosystems, you have a lot more species that can be found within each of those ecosystems. And so it kind of makes sense that this area in the West does have this, this high diversity of species. Sadly, a lot of them are on the endangered species. I wonder if that's the result of California. Anyway, um, I thought this was a pretty cool map. Just so you know, Florida has a ton of those endangered fishes. Um, and so pretty interesting to see where you find endangered species in the United States. A very good um, observation there, Trish, regarding the Appalachian. And th that actually goes to speak to what I was saying with those elevational changes, you have a higher variety of ecosystems. And the same thing holds true for the Appalachian Mountains. So top of the Appalachian Mountains, you've got a different series and set of trees, um, different climates, or not climates, but uh, temperature ranges there. And so obviously the mountains definitely provide a whole uh, myriad of ecosystems that are in just a very, very short geographic area. So, or a very small geographic area. Okay, so moving on. This is where you're gonna have to get your typing fingers out because your microphones aren't working. So, you know what? I'm gonna try something. Hey, Trish, let me know if you can unmute because I just asked to unmute. Can you talk I think now? I'm good. Yeah. Oh, can I can. Me? I'll do that to everyone. You don't have to talk if you don't want to. <laughs> it's so much easier. Oh gosh, it's hard for me because I get discombobulated when I got to read the chat box. No, so it's think... cool. I'd rather not type. So it's all good. Okay. Okay. Up to this point, I'm I'm going to talk about some more of the famous um, endangered species in North America. Up to this point, does anyone have any questions about the Endangered Species Act? Daryl, this is Patricia. I had one. Did this, the Pebble Mine Project, is it being reviewed under ESA or is that strictly EPA? Well, it's, e ESA is absolutely coming into play there. And just so everyone knows what the Pebble Mine Project is, there, there is this big proposed mine in, what, what's the name of the bay there in Alaska? Oh, I you got me there. It's, 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 it's above Katmai. Yeah, it's it's in one of the most pristine areas of Alaska. And they're proposing it, this, Is it Bristol Bay? I, I believe so. Yeah. And so they're proposing this huge mine that will impact that whole Bristol Bay area. And so there's there's all these environmental assessments taking place. And obviously ESA will come into play. Now, let me go backwards for a second to get this map. Now, believe it or not, Patricia, look look at Alaska. You're, there's not many species there. Like in Florida, ESA comes to play all the time. Same thing with Southern California. But having said that, any action that is proposed, especially on those federal properties, if there is an endangered species, there's only a couple of them in Alaska. But if it's gonna have a major negative impact on those species in that area, absolutely. There, there's going to have to be mitigations put into place. Um, I do know that there's a big, big rally to stop that whole proposal altogether, but they will definitely have to deal with uh, whatever endangered species are in that area. So any other questions before I start quizzing you or talking about this stuff? Okay. All right. Who knows what that animal is? Anyone? Anyone? That's a red wolf. Very good. Was that Trish that chimed in? Yeah. Um, and if anyone needs to unmute, just write, write it in the chat. Um, but yes, that is a red wolf. Very, very good. It, it, it does kind of look like a cross between a gray wolf and a coyote. Um, and that's what some some people suggest is that that's all that the red wolves are. But for now, they are classified as an endangered species. In fact, they're probably one of the most endangered species in the entire world. Reason being, if you look at their historic range, 
their historic range was this whole yellow area. And this was hundreds of years ago. The red wolf was one of the apex predators in this whole southeastern area of North America. Guess what? Early Europeans, they don't like things that compete with them, so they wiped them out. And so they were trapped, they were shot, they were completely removed because there was this feeling, and it, I, I keep blaming early Europeans, it's pretty much humans in general, most humans, they have this fear of predators, and it's understandable. As humans were evolving, not only were they competing for food resources, but they could kill us <laughs> as well. And so you you have these these fairy tale stories from hundreds and hundreds of years ago about the big bad wolf and things like that. And so predators and carnivores have been persecuted by humans throughout our history. And so anyway, the red wolf was this species of wolf that was found. It's separate from the gray wolf, which was found out throughout the rest of North America. But the red wolf was primarily in the Southeast. And we did a great job, which means we did an awful job. And we literally wiped them all out. So if you look at this inset, this little island here is just this little tiny piece of coastal North Carolina. That is where all the red wolves in the wild currently reside. They, sadly, it got down to about less than 20 animals within the last year or two. So they've been heavily, heavily impacted. In fact, they've revised the red wolf recovery plan. Now, you have probably heard me talk about some of the Red Wolf recovery efforts that took place in the Smokies in the mid 1990s. Mm -hmm. They were trying to restore Red Wolves into Great Smoky Mountain National Park. That didn't pan out. So they collected all the wolves. They moved them to coastal North Carolina, where they still reside today. They're doing OK. They're struggling because they're not expanding, but they're considering whether or not there's ever going to be more areas in the southeast that they can restore these wolves to. But guess what? Predator and carnivore management is difficult, especially when you're proposing releasing a predator onto the landscape. Now, you can do it out west where there's not many people, but the majority of people in North America live east of the Mississippi. And people, like I said, they have this innate fear of big scary things even though these aren't even big scary animals and so it, it'll be interesting it's also very sad at what the fate of the red wolf may hold because people just don't tolerate wolves very much and so right now like i said they're probably one of the most endangered species in all of the entire world since there's less than 20. now i will say there's a few hundred in captivity and they use those captive wolves to, for potential releases into the wild. But right now they're only hanging on by their fingertip in the wilds along coastal North Carolina. Okay, next question. I'm not even gonna ask, y'all know that this is a grizzly or I shouldn't say grizzly, that's its nickname. The, the species of this animal is actually a brown bear. And so how could a brown bear be listed on the Endangered Species Act. Now, historically, if you look at this green area, they were found throughout the whole western half of North America. Uh, but again, uh, humans, the early Eastern Europeans, they kind of killed things that they didn't like. And so their current range is this orangey type of coloration. Now, they're all throughout Alaska all throughout a great part of the Northwestern area of Canada. So there's a lot of brown bears or grizzly bears out there. They're, they estimate some 80,000 brown bears. And just so you know, globally, they're all over uh, Russia, even uh, in Europe. So globally, brown bears are thriving. They're doing fantastic. Why in the world are they listed as an endangered species? Well, the reason being, the Endangered Species Act says you can you can look at disjunct populations. And so if there's a group of animals, because of acts of humans, it is now isolated and separated by itself, that disjunct population can then be managed as an endangered species. 
and this has caused we could spend an hour excuse me an hour talking about this because it has caused quite a quite a stir in the in the wildlife world when we're talking about grizzlies as an endangered species again worldwide they're doing fine but the endangered grizzlies are those grizzlies lo located in that greater yellowstone area now the recovery plan when they wrote the recovery plan to recover grizzlies in that yellowstone area this yellow line is the grizzly bear recovery zone they're saying we need to restore grizzly and just so you know back in a couple of decades ago um back in the 70s and 80s there was very very few grizzlies within this yellow line but now since they were put on the endangered species act and this recovery plan was developed, their population has grown and grown and grown. And now you look at 2016, and they're they're not only recovered, fully recovered in that yellow line, they're expanding way beyond it. And so if you follow wildlife at all, there's there's all this debate of delisting grizzlies or listing grizzlies. The one thing, the one thing that I don't get. It, well, no, I do get it, but the goal of the Endangered Species Act and developing these recovery plans is to get an animal off the list. And so when there is enough data or information to say this species is recovered, we're going to remove it from the endangered species list, that's a reason to rejoice. And it seems like a lot of people will hear an animal is going to be delisted and they they get upset, but <laughs> maybe it's my way of thinking because when I hear an animal is going to be delisted, it's like yes, we did good things, we restored them. Um, but the, the caveat with grizzlies is the whole hunted uh, aspect of it because most other animals aren't hunted, so I do understand that aspect of it. Anyway, so grizzlies are on the endangered species list, but it's only those greater Yellowstone grizzlies. It's not the, the grizzlies all throughout Alaska and Canada and, and that continuous population. All right. I don't know what kind of animal that is. The Anyone? ferret? Yes. It is a black-footed ferret. Only ferret found in North America. And it was so... People usually recognize this as being a a pet, and I've, obviously the pet trade breeds these, so they're not they're not in danger of going extinct um, globally in the world in the entire world because of that pet trade. But in the wild, the black footed ferret, believe it or not, there was a time when they thought they were gone. There's no more black footed ferrets left in the wild, and then a farmer showed up like one showed up at a farm where no one expected it to to be found and that started they were listed as an endangered species they thought they were an extinct species in the wild but they were discovered lots of efforts put into black-footed ferret recovery and now they're they're doing much much better hundreds and hundreds of animals or black-footed ferrets now survive in the wild the interesting thing here and to give you an idea of Oh my gosh, um, whoever the Apple server person is, I don't know your name. You are spot on. That's what I was going to bring up. What they discovered, like when, when you're developing that recovery plan, I mentioned about uh, the biologists figure out those key elements. And one of the key elements that black-footed ferrets require are prairie dog towns. They, they thrive in areas that have prairie dogs. And so that is one of the key elements identified. Like if there's going to be an area for uh, black-footed ferret reintroduction, you got to make sure that there's a viable, thriving prairie dog town in that area. In fact, where I used to work on the Jemez, in the Jemez Mountain Santa Fe National Forest in northern New Mexico, um, they were they're, they're considering releasing black-footed ferrets in that area, but they're waiting for the prairie dog population to increase to a an amount that can support the the black-footed ferrets. So fantastic response there, whoever you are. <laughs> so, oops, I forgot to put the name. Yeah, that's a black-footed ferret. Okay, thanks, Bet. 
The hubby was facility manager at Pinon Canyon Maneuver Site in Southern Colorado, where they studied. Oh, cool. Yeah, um, Southern Colorado. I was in northern New Mexico. But yeah, the the reliance of those ferrets on prairie dogs is it's one of those key elements. So if you're trying to recover that species, you got to make sure you've got this other species handy and in abundance. All right. I won't quiz you. Y'all know that's a manatee. Um, Florida manatee. Manatee, they're one of the big things. I, I feel so bad. They're they're also called sea cows. They're really cool, docile animals. They feed on uh, some of the grasses that grow in those real shallow areas around the Florida Everglades. Sadly, they get one of the biggest impacts to these Florida manatees is humans and recreating on boats. You oftentimes will see some of these manatees with the propeller scars because they can't move very fast. And the more humans are recreating on the water, the more imperiled these, these beautiful creatures are. All right, anyone, all right, I assume everyone knows that's a turtle. Anyone know what kind of turtle that is? This is on the endangered, there's, there's a number of turtle species on the endangered species list, but this is one that you may have heard of before. One is of the, the bigger- is it, is it the hawkbill? Not the hawkbill. Very, very good guess. It is a loggerhead sea turtle. So one of, one of the bigger sea turtles, this was subject to a lot of, uh, they're getting caught in a lot of commercial fishing nets. And so again, this, this whole Endangered Species Act, it, it's not just for mammals. Now, my focus is mammals. So I, I talk about a lot of the mammals, but we're we're looking out for any of those wildlife species out there that are in that on that brink of extinction. All right, here's my favorite: <laughs> a cougar. How in the world can a cougar be on the endangered species list? Um, and I hate that they call it this, but they call it the Florida panther. It's it's still a cougar. It's still a mountain lion. It's still a puma. It's it's the exact same cat. But if you look at the range for the cougar, you see they're found all throughout the western half of North America. So they're they're not even close to being endangered. But remember, I was talking about those disjunct, those isolated populations. Um, look at the Panhandle of Florida. That's what the area they call those Florida panthers, even though they're the exact same cat that are found here. So these cougars are labeled as an endangered species in Florida. <laughs> what was interesting with the Florida panther is decades ago, we used to have, well, we still do have genus and species, and then there's subspecies or variety. We, we break it out even further. And a lot of those subspecies were based on morphometric characteristics, like the shape of the skull or the coloration or some physical difference. It might be very, very slight, but they said, oh, this, this group of cougars is a little bit different here in Florida than the ones out West because they look a little bit different. Well, lo and behold, with the development and onset of genetic work and improving genetic work. They found out that the cats in Florida were genetically identical to the Western cats. And in fact, that kind of helped them out a little bit because these the these cougars in Florida, their population was really struggling. I think it dropped down to about 80 animals in the entire Florida peninsula. And so after they discovered that they were genetically identical to the cats in the West, they captured some cats in Texas and moved them to prevent so much inbreeding. Because obviously, if you're breeding with similar family members, there's so many genetic anomalies that then get expressed and um, their, their health decreases. And so they brought in some of these Texas cats to boost the population, increase the genetic diversity, and they're doing much better. I think they're up to about 160 animals now, 180 animals. Anyway, um, the Florida panther is listed on the endangered species list. What about this guy? This, this one's pretty easy. Everyone knows this is a gray wolf. Um, so this, this was the wolf that wandered over 
most of North America. Remember, this area here in the southeast was the red wolf. The gray wolf occupied most of the rest of the United States. Now, this is where it gets sticky because very much like the grizzly population, remember the grizzlies are doing fine worldwide. Guess what? Gray wolves are doing even finer. There's there's wolves everywhere throughout the world. <laughs> but what they did is they put the gray wolf, these distinct populations on the endangered species list. So you have this continental divide area. You have this Western uh, Great Lake population. And even this population, These the, they're called Mexican wolves, but they're still gray wolves. And so each of these were listed on the endangered species list because they were disjunct. They're worried about these populations blinking out. Now, I will tell you the world of wolves is a mess because as you know, the Endangered Species Act, whenever the government does things, things get complicated and there's lawsuits and there's litigation. And so there's this constant battle you look at the recovery plans and wolves are doing fantastic. The, these wolves in these, these two northern populations, they've grown tremendously. So there was a push to delist them. But because they're hunted, people started, the states allowed hunting to control their population. And then you get people fighting and filing lawsuits to relist them. And so it's gone back and forth. And there was, there's recent, um, uh, rulings by some of the courts that said, okay, the Western Great Lake populations are now protected again. They're on the endangered species list, but the Northern Rocky Mountain population, they're not protected. So, And then there was a ruling just today or yesterday that that was restoring some of the protections to the Northern. It's, like I said, it's a mess, depending on what side you're fighting for. It just bounces back and forth. I think the takeaway message there is because there's this fight to list or relist or delist, wolves are doing pretty darn good. And a lot of it has to do with the protections that were afforded under the Endangered Species Act. So a lot, lots to be hopeful for in that world. All right. I will quiz you on this. I don't know what kind of bird that is. It's a condor. Very, very good. California condor. Now the tough question. What was one of the main issues that was the California condor was facing? And in fact, it's still facing it today. What what do you think kills a lot of condors? Now, it kills not just a lot of condors, but they're finding more and more of those, those apex predator bird species are impacted by this. Rodenticide, that's Red one of them. Farms? Um, well, but it, you, you're all on the same page. Rodenticide, they're, they're getting poisoned. And a lot of times people will put out poison to kill small animals around their house and their, on their farms. And that rodenticide, when those prey items pick up that poison, then those birds of prey eat it. It gets transferred to them. But another big thing is condors are very much like um, vultures is they will eat a lot of carrion and what they're finding is a lot of these birds both condors and bald eagles um, they will ingest lead from the environment and a lot of it has to do with when hunters will shoot a deer or an elk or something they, they'll gut the animal which is fine and then they take the rest of the meat out with them but in that gut pile sometimes there's a lead fragment and when these birds of prey or even birds of prey are extremely, extremely susceptible to lead. So other animals will eat it, coyotes will eat it, but when these birds of prey eat it, it gets stuck in their in their crop and it begins to slowly poison them. And so California, this is a California condor, by the way. Uh, California has outlawed the use of lead bullets by hunters. You got to use another type of metal for your bullets and that's that was solely based on trying to protect the california condor now when you take a billion dollar economy like the hunting economy of california and you say you can no longer use lead bullets 
again, that is how powerful the Endangered Species Act is. So they can, they can really set some regulations that impact a lot and a lot of people. So anyway, those were some of the more popular um, animals listed on the Endangered Species Act. I just realized how long I'm talking. I was worried I wouldn't, wouldn't talk long enough. I'm just going to go real quickly through some issues. Now, this is a photo. I won't quiz you because, hell, <laughs> I probably wouldn't even have guessed it. Um, I know about this bird. This is a golden-winged warbler. They were considered being listed on the Endangered Species Act. Here's another bird. This is a cerulean warbler, also being considered or was being considered on the endangered species list. So two warblers, both these birds were found in Tennessee where I used to work. This golden wing warbler, guess what kind of habitat it likes? It loves open fields, early successional habitat, grassland, those open areas where a forest is regenerating. So there's no forest there. So open, open canopy areas. The cerulean warbler, which could also be found in the same area as the golden wing, they love mature forests, these old, not old growth forests, but mature, fully grown forests. They don't like those openings. So what if, what if you have critical habitat for a golden wing warbler and a cerulean warbler in the same area? What, what are you to do? If you're trying to do good things for the golden wing warbler, you would be clearing the forest to create the habitat that the golden warbler, golden wing warbler likes. But in that same instance where you're helping one species, you're wiping out habitat for the cerulean warbler. And so these are some of the issues that you got to think, you, you don't realize are there, then you're like, huh, wow, that stinks. <laughs> so sometimes the, the way to manage these animals could be in conflict with each other, especially if they're found in the exact same area. Everyone should know what this is. And I remember being a little kid. These things were all over the place. Does anyone know what kind of butterfly that is? Monarch. 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 Yeah. Um, I remember as a little kid growing up in Buffalo, New York, we used to play in the fields. We had milkweed everywhere. There is monarchs everywhere. And now, believe it or not, they were years and years ago, they were proposed to be a candidate that someone says, hey, we need to list monarchs because their populations are plummeting and so for years and years and years they've been studying the monarch and so they were they were a candidate species for listing and guess what the ruling was i was just reading it the other day the ruling that the u.s fish and wildlife service said yes monarch butterflies need to be listed but we have so many other animals that are higher priority that we can't do anything with them yet and so that's a that's a huge issue. There, there are so many species we're dealing with that some species fall by the wayside. And so we know that monarchs need help. They need listing, but we don't have the means to do everything for every species. And so that leads me to this very last issue. You You know that's a grizzly bear. You might even know what grizzly bear that is. That's a one of the famous grizzly bears in Teton. Well, yeah, just outside of Yellowstone in um, uh, Teton National Park, Great Teton National Park. That is bear 399. Old, beautiful, 26-year-old female grizzly. Fantastic mother. And she had four. The, the reason she was so became so notorious is how many cubs she has raised. And this was from a couple of years ago. It's on usually female grizzlies will give birth to one or two cubs. Sometimes it's three. It's almost unheard of of having four cubs. Not only having four cubs, but successfully raising four cubs. But she she was able to do it. But she's on that endangered species list or grizzlies in that greater Yellowstone area. So this was this high profile species. When I took the swap students out there to the Tetons a couple of years ago, we we were talking about these animals and this particular animal. And it was shared that they end up, they calculated, they spend millions of dollars 
sometimes millions within one year managing this one bear or, or a handful of bears. And so they're getting all this money to do these bear brigades, to do all this management for these, a couple of grizzlies, which I think is great. I love grizzlies, but what about this guy? It's also on the endangered species list. This is, this is a jumping mouse, New Mexico meadow jumping mouse. Why is that one bear worth millions and millions of dollars and the jumping mouse barely gets a penny? They're all, they're all unique species just because one's bigger than the other. Um, and so this is the quandary is this endangered species. It's not meant to put one species above another species. And when you look at the animals on the endangered species list, you have you have different kinds of clams, salamanders, insects, crayfish, snakes. There's a whole slew of species. Why is one species more important than another species? And so these are some of the issues we deal with. Anyway, I got to start wrapping up. So is there success under the Endangered Species Act? And I guess it all depends on how you look at it, because believe it or not, since the Endangered Species Act, 99% of those species that are listed are still surviving. So they're surviving. We kept them from going extinct. Um, but then there's people say, well, only 3% of those listed animals have, have ever been delisted. So I guess it's kind of the glasses half full, half empty type of thing. Um, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful act. I will tell you, if I had my way, I wish we could go back in time to 1960s, early 1970s when they were developing this. I think it would have been so much better if they developed the Endangered Habitat Act because it would have been more manageable. Um, with the Endangered Species Act, there's just not enough resources sometimes to do everything that we want to do. So anyway, I will tell you folks, really cool, really interesting stuff talking about endangered species. This website here, I'm going to click on it, takes you to the Environmental Conservation Online System of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Absolutely, you, you can get lost in here, and I strongly urge you to go there. Um, you can look up all the different animals, like the species reports. Um, this is where I was getting a lot of those tables, a lot of the information. And so here's that table I was showing you. Uh, all you can look at all the animals, all the birds, all the clams, and this is just within the United States. So you can look at birds, and here's all the listed animals. The, these are the the birds listed on the endangered species list for North America, and they have uh, write-ups on each and every one of them, and whether or not there's a recovery plan. So. You, like I said, you can absolutely get lost. There's so many, so many cool things to look up um, on this website. So I strongly encourage you to go there. I tell you what, when I send out the recording, I will provide the link to this website because it's it's just absolutely fascinating. So anyway, let me go back to my slides. That's the end of it. Um, Y'all know how to follow Wildlife for You and the podcast we never do anymore, but best thing to do is follow us on Facebook. Mark your calendars. Uh, I think we're finally getting back on track. We're going to get back to the Tuesday, but the next webinar I'm going to do since we're getting into that winter wonderland and my hometown of Buffalo is expected to get six feet of snow. <laughs> we're going to talk about how wildlife can survive the old winter wonderland. And so you know why I do this, folks. It's because whenever it comes to wildlife, your knowledge often means their existence. So anyway, if you have any other questions whatsoever about the endangered species, ask away because that's what I'm here for. Just real quickly, Daryl. Yeah. So I was thinking, you know, little chicken little, the sky is falling. Yep. Are, are there like people who are alarmists? citizens and or biologists who may be like, uh... it, very very good and astute question there endangered species act is pretty powerful and it can be abused and when you say alarmist there's I, i'm a wildlife lover i want to protect animals as much as i can but there's some people or some organizations that may go over the top 
And they're always pushing to get more and more species listed on the endangered species list. Now, if it's warranted, that's fantastic. But you have to understand, in order to get a species listed, there has to be a ton of information that is rock solid to say, this species is in decline, and if we don't do something, we're going to lose it forever. Unfortunately, that takes a ton of time, ton of research to, to gather all that information. So if there's groups that are saying, you need to list this butterfly, this frog, all uh, suddenly the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is tied up trying to address all of these concerns. Now, obviously, we don't want something to fall through the cracks, but unless you already have some concrete proof to say this particular species is in jeopardy, it can be a big waste of resources. I'll give you a prime example. There is a, a huge push to list northern goshawks. And so for years and years, there's all this research being done. You know what they found out? Goshawks are doing pretty good. <laughs> and wow. so they didn't warrant list. And there's a lot of those candidate species where the final determination is it's not warranted. And so if you're spending most of your time researching the species and they're not warranted, all of that time and resource and effort can be spent helping those animals that are already on the list. And so I, I understand why you say the alarmists, they're, they're concerned about animals, but you also have to be reasonable and, and really take into account the effort and the we're not there. We're not there to let species die out. So if there's a concern, hopefully we'll catch it. But it can also, because it's so powerful, it can also be a huge drain of resources. Very good question, Trish. Thanks. And I oh. think I'm finished. Oh my gosh, I talked for well over an hour. I got to cut back. <laughs> All right, everybody have a good night. All right. Thanks. Thanks everyone for joining in. And if I, I'll send out the recording and that link to that Fish and Wildlife Service site because it is it is pretty awesome. So let me see if